<laughs> well, I know a number of heroic souls here this evening. <laughs> Survived the inclemency of the occasion. We hope that you will be glad you made the effort. This evening we have a story that differs considerably from the ones we have previously selected. And in this treatment tonight, we cannot hope to cover the countless interpretations that have been associated with the Faust myth. Therefore, we are going to select one which perhaps is not as frequently discussed as the others and add in such implications and extensions as time permits. In this story, we have a new group of highly symbolical factors. Part of the story lies in its historical orientation because it belongs to a very important period in the transitional life of early modern man. Part of its fascination also lies in its psychological implications. And these we will attempt to analyze briefly. But to first things first. Uh, the Faust myth, as we know it, has a rather complicated and confusing origin. Actually, the elements of the story, are many of them, very ancient. But they gradually came to be centered upon a possibly historical person, Dr. Faustus. <coughs> A curious man of many interesting attributes who is believed to have lived in the 15th century at a time when to think at all was to be suspected of sorcery and to be a well-ordered thinker was to be regarded as in league with the devil. Thus, the fame of poor old Dr. Faust, like that of Cagliostro, rest not so much upon what he did as what was done to him, both actually and symbolically. For what little we know of the original man, he seems to have been a rather quiet, orderly scholar who lived a comparatively uninteresting life with one exception. And perhaps from this hangs the whole tale. In a time when such things apparently were not done, he trained a dog. Now this in itself was a very terrible mistake as far as the reputation of a reputable college professor was concerned. He had a dog that would do tricks. This dog would on command lie down, roll over, sit on his hind legs and beg for food. It was obvious to any respectable person of the time that, that this dog had to be a demon in disguise because ordinary dogs did not behave in this contrary to canine manner. And as a result of having trained a dog, this poor old gentleman came into very ill repute. Apparently he had one or two other oddities of temperament also. But this one was irrefutable evidence that he was not normal. Of course today in a day of pets and um, in a time when we have seeing eye dogs and dogs and circuses and everything, it's hard to imagine uh, what a hard reputation could arise from such a slight cause. But this, plus local gossip, got the poor doctor into a serious dilemma. And gradually he came to be identified as the perfect magician. Probably he added to his uh, dog training proclivities an interest in certain subjects then not regarded as quite honorable. He was a Kabbalist, he dabbled in astrology, and may even have gone so far as to try to compound the philosopher's stone. Thus to his demoniacal interests were added another uh, classification. He was a lunatic. He was concerned in secret arts and so forth, which not only were not respectable, but were impossible. So by degrees his madness grew, and with it his fame. It is said, of course, that in the end this poor kindly man was carried away to the underworld by his attendant demon, 
This was accompanied by many signs and wonders. Uh, perhaps we must discount some of them because the occurrence took place immediately after a convivial gathering of professors and old students during which a number of them were unable to remember exactly what occurred. But uh, in this convivial occasion the doctor disappeared and the history of the gentleman ceases to be of any great moment to us. So out of this incident came a story which has been dramatized and has inspired some of the most remarkable productions in the literary history of Western uh, symbolical writing. But of course, the masterpiece of all these works is the poem by Goethe, which becomes the basis of the opera, which makes use of sections from the first part of the poem. Before, however, we go on now to analyze uh, the significance of the total piece, we must get a certain cast of characters in order, and we must try to understand exactly what they imply, because from one symbolism we can pass to another, and once we have a certain key, we can expand this into almost any field of activity that we so desire. Uh, the study of uh, grimoires and other works on black magic relating to the medieval period present us, first of all, with an extraordinary psychological situation, a situation uh, that arose from the benightedness of the times, uh, from the gradual collapse of earlier cultural systems, the almost complete prevalence of illiteracy, and numerous other negative vicissitudes. During this time, uh, marked, of course, by such official pronouncements as the malus maleficarum, or the hammer of evil, and things of that nature, it was firmly believed in Europe that demons not only existed, but existed primarily to plague the righteous. Uh, it was not uncommon to find beautifully carved imps sticking their wooden heads out from under the edges of pews, and it was believed that you were not safe even in church. Uh, some uh, are even of the opinion you were least safe there. It was all in a point of view. Also, no one went out at night, because not only were there demons under the doorsteps, but they might be lurking anywhere, even in the breast of your nearest and dearest friend. Also, these demons, if they did nothing else to you, exposed you to fresh air, which was regarded as a deadly poison at that time, perhaps due to the fact that there was very little of it, due to the prevailing custom of dumping the garbage into the middle of the streets. In the days of the glory of Florence, in the days of the mighty Florentines, all refuse was thrown into the middle of the streets at night, and the streets were scavenged with swine, who were driven through in packs to clean the streets, and the next day the swine were killed for food. It was a really a, a happy, optimistic <laughs> situation, uh, considerably prior to the time of the pure food and drug laws. Uh, this led to an interesting custom that we still maintain, and that is that when a lady and gentleman walk on the street, it is customary for the gentleman to walk on the side toward the curb. Uh, this was because it was the most dangerous side when things were being thrown out of the windows. <laughs> uh, many of our common habits arise from such unsuspected sources. In any event, Europe was in a very bad condition. And the situation was complicated by what we call today the Protestant Reformation. Now, most liberal thinkers feel that this was the great decision uh, between Martin Luther and the Church. But much more was involved than this, because we have to realize that the, that the Reformation took place at a time when not only man did not know what Reformation meant, but was scarcely equipped to sustain a general reformation of any kind, personal or collective. And so the reformation produced a whole series of consequences, which certainly were not intended, but were nevertheless extremely important in the psychological story of the modern world. The first thing the reformation did, obviously, was to break the tradition between medieval man and the church. Now this, however, was merely a physical break. It did not represent, truly, a psychological break. 
uh, the uh, abuses and fanaticisms uh, against which the individual rebelled were essentially within himself. And after he had ceased to be a fanatical member of the old denominations, he became a fanatical member of the new denominations. His fanaticism was not touched by the Reformation itself. He did not change as a person. But he made a series of discoveries. And these discoveries influenced his entire psychological life. And when the Reformation began to take on serious proportions, the church thundered its anathemas against the reformers. It did everything possible to destroy them and succeeded in eliminating a good many. But it also excommunicated and declared heretical and uh, cast its anathemas wide and far. And to the amazement of everyone involved, nothing happened. Uh, those individuals who had just been excommunicated did not fall dead, as they were expected to do. Their fields did not suddenly become sterile. Their cattle did not run dry. Uh, their own affairs went along very much as before. And it seemed that the sun still shone upon them in the daytime and the stars at night. Now this was a very disconcerting state of affairs. It caused a certain inevitable doubt to arise in the public mind as to how important the anathemas were, because everyone seemed to survive them in fair shape. The moment the anathemas were attacked, the foundation of religion was attacked. It was suddenly obvious, or at least it seemed to be obvious to these people, that this infallible body upon which they had depended for ages, and which had kept them under a certain spell, was not infallible. Now, if we were thoughtful people in those days, and uh, really reasoned things through on the level of uh, fair knowledge and culture, a moderate course might have been followed. But in those days, the ignorant man, as today, is a man of extremes. And when his old faith was shaken, all his faith was shaken simultaneously. And if the old church was not infallible, perhaps there was no infallibility. Perhaps if God did not strike the heretic dead, there was no God. These attitudes of extremism uh, marked this transition period and resulted in a wave of disbelief, of unbelief a wave of almost forlorn fear, which not only attacked religion, but also attacked the great educational institutions that then flourished under the broad wing of religion. If the church was wrong in its ability, or lacked the ability, uh, to enforce its anathemas, all knowledge might be wrong. Everything could be wrong. There might be nothing to which any human being could cling. A man at that time with nothing to cling to was in a very sorry state because he lacked resources in himself. He lacked any other direction in which to turn. So the uh, Protestant Reformation led to a series of rather powerful conclusions. Uh, one group after the Reformation became, became the square-toed pilgrim, the individual who clung to practically every essential doctrine of the old faith but removed from it nearly all glamour. He took away art, music. He took away the magnificence of the cathedral. He took away the mass and the great ritual and found himself in a strangely dull and melancholy kind of faith that became more and more bitter, more and more pessimistic, and more and more inclined to persecute any dissenters within its own ranks. We find this in the splendid story of the Pilgrim Fathers, who, coming all the way to our western continent to find religious liberty, immediately excommunicated from their own community anyone who differed from them in anything. It was a period of great psychological unrest. And in this period, there began to arise a certain kind of philosophic materialism which we have called a form of humanism. 
This humanism was quite different, however, from the idealistic humanism of the 18th and 19th centuries, and very different from the other materialistic humanism of the 20th century. This humanism was a certain bewilderment in that time. Man suddenly looking out upon a world began to reorient his own relationship with it. In the old days, man was important. Under theology, man was just about the most important thing in the universe. His creation was a special act of God, and when God had created man, God looked around and said, this is the best work I ever did, I shall never die to improve on it. So that uh, this was the noblest work of God. Man was therefore a special creation. The world in which he lived was a garden that had been given to him. The creatures in it were there to serve him and to supply him with food and clothing. Everything, even the stars and the sky, were to light his way. And when Savonarola questioned whether or not the stars were chandeliers to help folks home at night, he was promptly burned at the stake for questioning such a reasonable and natural hypothesis. Then suddenly came this situation, brought indirectly as the result of the Reformation. Man was nothing. The universe was everything. The world was enormous. The orientations of man were infantile. The question arose, did he know anything? Could he know anything? The whole structure of classical learning was undermined. Men no longer believed in the great traditions that had gone before. And this broad disillusionment stretched itself across the face of learning in every level and in every department. And out of it came gradually this new and entirely different orientation. Man, a poor, naked, unequipped, uninformed creature, helpless and hopeless in the midst of a vast creation which Galileo and Copernicus had begun to put in order for him. Man was suddenly ignorant. Not only ignorant, but not at all certain that he could ever know. And all of man's problem, his great uncertainty, his confusion, all these things are summed up in the personality of Faust and the sub-Faust, which associates with him in this great allegory. So we are not surprised to find that after the prologue in heaven, we are introduced to Faust himself, a bitter, disillusioned man, a man whose scholarship has led him to naught. A man who is discouraged with all the ways of learning and wisdom. He has explored, he has sought, he has questioned, he has read the ancient books and studied the old manuscripts. But here he stands with all his lore, a fool no wiser than before. And in these words, Dr. Faust was speaking for a hundred or a hundred and fifty years of European culture at a time when disillusionment and a complete resigning to the hopelessness of ever knowing anything um, dominated European thinking. Now out of humanism came the new God, the God that was to make way for the rise of industrialism, the rise of the a posteriori approach to philosophy, the, uh, the type of thinking that was to pave the way for Bacon, Descartes, Voltaire, and Rousseau. A new kind of world was coming into existence. So we must now begin to study the nature of this world a little. And to do it, we must go back uh, to the source of most of these concepts, particularly in a poetic work of this nature. And we must study you know, our Greek myths, uh, the, uh, the legendary background. Now, among the Greeks, there was a deity who in those old days was a very kindly, uh, rather good-hearted, good-natured deity. He was a human being, part of his body that of a fawn or a satyr. This was the great god Pan, and he lived in the reeds by the river. And here he played upon his shepherd's pipes, and he was the god of nature, and he was the god of the meadows and the valleys and the rich fields of grain. Now, nature to the Greek 
would naturally be kindly because he was a nature lover. Uh, the Greek was never burdened with a kind of theology that was heavy with mortal sin. He had no such concept of life. To him, the uh, worship of the gods was a pleasant affair, to be accompanied by dance and festival, and to be celebrated in the altars, in the groves, and by the roadside where flowers and fruit were brought to the various homes of the deities and divinities. So this uh, rather kindly, optimistic, extroverted group of people saw in the god Pan a very near and dear friend because he was with them in the streams and in the seas and in the lakes and the rivers. He was always there and with the flowers of summer and the wind blowing through the bree and through the trees and he was a very congenial type of individual. Now this deity Pan was usually represented with a human head with very sharp ears and short blunt horns on his forehead. The upper part of his body was human, but the lower part ended in the hoofs of an animal. He had a short tail which he could waggle very strenuously, and he was particularly fond of running about the countryside, playing with the children and all these things, and when other matters did not uh, interfere, he liked to be a shepherd and to play his uh, flute of seven reeds uh, in the uh, dusk of the evening where his music could be heard through the hills, echoing uh, happily and rhythmically. Now, when the changes of religious belief came along, there was a saying that with the rise of the church, great Pan died. And such is said to have been the statement of the oracle. But actually, the great Pan did not die because the new religion wouldn't let him die. Uh, such a pleasant, natural, and terminal condition for the happy god of the valleys was not permitted. One of the early habits that we find among many religious groups, and this goes into all parts of the world, is that the gods of former religions were gradually transformed into the demons of the new religion. Thus we uh, attempted to cast particular disrepute upon all faiths. So the happy, pleasant, kindly deity Pan was transformed into a demon. He was transformed into a devil with a cloven hoof and horns on his forehead, and his pleasant music was transformed into a kind of dance of death, so that all who followed him lost their souls. This new kind of devil was given a region over which he ruled, a region of chaos, confusion, and destruction, attended by all the nymphs and satyrs and nereids of the old belief, and this region was appropriately called pandemonium. And we still have the word as a symbol of utter and complete confusion. There was no greater confusion than that which arose concerning Pan himself and what was done to him. Now, in the old medieval demonologies, we have another good example of this same uh, practice of changing uh, de uh, gods into demons. The prince of demons, the prince of hell, the prince of darkness in the days when witchcraft was in flower, uh, was called Beelzebub the prince of darkness. And he was supposed to be really the number one demon in the entire hierarchy of the damned. Now his name comes from Baal Zebub, uh, a very ancient Babylonian deity. In fact, the deity Baal of the ancients was really a very good god. In fact, he was the savior god of the Babylonians. And uh, he was represented by an image much like that of the Memnon in the Egyptian desert, one of which has an Aeolian harp in its head, so that when the wind blows through the openings and the uh, special arranged chambers in the head, the image is made to sing or to make a sound. Therefore, we have uh, the particular attributes of Baal preserved, Baal Zebub, my lord who sings. And out of my lord who sings came a being so monstrous and terrifying that it frightened about 300 years of good Christians into an early grave. It was a, a very sad situation, but all part of a prevailing madness that took some time to subside. Now, Pan, of course, is the origin of our Mephistopheles. 
who even in the direful and dourest moments of his career of conspiracy proclaims himself in the story of Faust as part of the power that still works for good while ever scheming ill. Mephisto, in this case, the word Mephistopheles, has never been adequately derivated. We do not know exactly where it comes from, but we think from a Latin deity, Mephistus, which probably uh, could have originated it, particularly because the Latin deity was a pleasant, cheerful, happy, and benevolent creature, just as far from this monster as you can possibly imagine. Now, why should Mephisto appear in this curious likeness? Why should great Pan take on so monstrous a shape and appear, as he does in the opera, as a gallant cavalier uh, with his tight-fitting red suit and his black cape and the long feather in his cap and all of the um, appearance of a man of gentle parts and good character? Actually, with Faust representing the, con the confusion of a collapsing ethical system and the rise of humanism, Mephisto, as Pan, fits perfectly into the required picture because Mephisto represents, as Pan did, primarily the physical universe, nature itself, the earth, with its mountains and its valleys and its seas. Therefore, the power of Mephisto lay in the fascination of the material world, a fascination which began to take hold of the minds of European uh, thinkers after the Protestant Reformation. Suddenly, man found himself, much as the, in the story of Robinson Crusoe, where he stands upon a desert island in space and proclaims himself master of all he surveys. And medieval man, emancipated from the clergy, was now master of all he surveyed, and needless to say, when he looked around, he didn't see too much, because not only he lacked the power to see, but he suddenly realized that he was abysmally ignorant of nature, of nature's laws, nature's ways, nature's plans. He had suddenly conceived that it was his right, his possible achievement, that he should create a way of life. This had never before occurred to him. Up to that time, he had been instructed that he was to live and die within a pattern, a pattern established by antiquity, a pattern sustained and supported by the great institutions that overshadowed his individual thinking. And suddenly, the infallibility of these institutions was shaken and they fell about him. And man emerged. Man emerged almost like a second Adam in a garden of Eden. He emerged into a material world which challenged him in every direction which captured his fascination, uh, which began its insidious effect upon his total integration. Now we have to also recognize that the material world, to a measure, represents materialism. So we find that man, falling suddenly away from the clergy, suddenly falls into the grip of materialism as the antithesis of theology. Suddenly the individual, bewildered by the collapse of his gods and godlings, faced only a world that extended in the term of maps, rivers, and nations, and boundaries. Most of all, he faced a world which he must build, in which he must find securities, he must create them. The natural result was a tremendous, if gradual, development of personal ambition. Little by little, the individual released an extremely powerful personal psychic urge. The urge to not only adjust to this earth, but to dominate it, to become master of it, <coughs> to become uh, the ruler of this planet upon which he dwelt. It certainly became the power, or at least the dream, of the simple man, the simple citizen, that he could become a builder of worlds. So Mephisto, Mephisto represents not only materialism as latent physical experience, but materialism as the rise of a great psychic temptation. The temptation to focus every resource upon matter. Uh, the temptation to place physical achievement before and above everything else. 
the temptation to accept as real only that which can be held in the hands, the temptation to forego the things of the spirit and to grasp the things of the body. By degrees man's consciousness turned outward, leaving the abstract and ethical principles and clinging more and more to success, to physical achievement, to competition, and to the unfoldment of a positive and powerful, all-absorbing institution which we call progress. So Mephisto plays a series of roles, and as we study him in the play, we discover, for example, that Mephisto was apparently enjoying himself in a very comfortable and pleasant way in his own private, sulfurious abode. He was not at all anxious to become the servant of Faust, but Faust by magic invoked him, and the demon, because he must obey certain exorcisms if they are properly given, was forced to come. And having arrived, like all good demons should, he made the best of a bad bargain. Never for one moment did he respect Faust. Never for a moment did he recognize Faust as anything but an arrogant fool. But Faust had the peculiar skill to control him according to ancient law, and Mephisto could wait his time, because he knew that the very process that Faust was using, this effort to grasp control and command by the sorcery of his mind, must ultimately end in Faust's destruction. In the end, Mephisto would take away the soul of the magician and carry it back to the regions from which he had come. So Mephisto could bide his time and wait until the proper moment. It was of no great importance anyway. So Mephisto plays along, and he has a nice way about him. Uh, when Faust is depressed, Mephisto cheers him up. He is always comforting, always giving good, bad advice, always recommending whatever Faust wants to do, and always available to help the magician achieve the impossible, ever remembering that each new achievement precipitated Faust nearer to the ultimate destruction. So that Mephisto uh, had the uh, subtle realization that regardless of what happened, he would win. That it was inevitable that this soul of Faust would ultimately be his. Now the third important person in our drama is Marguerite. And of course this character, more than any of the others, has been involved in numerous literary changes and adaptations. It is believed that the structure for her, as it occurs in the story by Goethe, is derived from an early uh, romance that actually happened in the poet's life. But when he was about 16 years old, he fell in love with a beautiful girl by the name of Margaret, and she seems to have found her way into his story. Uh, the tie is apparently quite loose and inadequate, but uh, actually a little more profound than we first imagined. Now when the great struggle for supremacy, when uh, the powers of the world, whether they are vast uh, combines, dictators, or whether they be uh, great motions of industry and economics, upon whose head does the burden always fall? And the answer, of course, is what we would term the collective structure of society. Underneath the load of every generation stands the patient figure of the common man, who is the most uncommon of all men. Here we have, therefore, humanity. Here we have the world, which no matter who wins in the great battle of wits, the world must pay. The average human being must carry the responsibilities and consequences of all social change. And therefore, the betrayal of Marguerite simply represents a betrayal of the true psychic value in the life of collective humanity. In the story, then, to a great degree, Marguerite plays the part of the soul. For it is the soul that is always the victim of the ambitions of the mind and the schemes of the will. It is always the soul that must be crucified between the two thieves on every level of life and in every department of existence. 
So Marguerite represents the instinctive and natural nobility in human life, uh, which is betrayed, and which is brought to madness and death by this conspiracy of powers with which our story is essentially concerned. Now to come a little more closely to our cast of characters, let us try to uh, identify in the terms of the period uh, these three characters just a little more specifically. Remember this story was developed at a time originally when these elements had begun to clarify a wee bit. A man recognized uh, three factors as fairly well distinguishable. By Faust, of course, we represent the human mind, reason. We represent uh, the essential search for knowledge. We find the individual who is the basic thinker, essentially, naturally, normally, the truth seeker. In this case, the disillusioned truth seeker, suffering from what has been called the Faustian complex. In the character of Mephisto, we are therefore introduced, and I say this with hushed apology to the learned, we are introduced with the, we might say, skeletal archetypal form of what we call today science. Mephisto is science. Mephisto is that mysterious power of exact knowledge, the tremendous concept of the laboratory, the tremendous growing, unfolding power of creating a rational instrumentation for the achievement of the ambitions of mankind. So uh, Mephisto appears in the, as the embodiment or personification of skill. A skill, a method, uh, which for its use and for its merits or demerits depends entirely upon the motives by which it is controlled. Man, for example, as Faust, by performing the correct exorcism, by using the words of power, by pronouncing them in their proper order, in, by, in other words, by following the rules exactly, can always demand the presence of power. He can always force skill to become his servant. But if in his ambition he perverts this skill to purposes which are not right or reasonable, this skill turns upon him and ultimately destroys him. Thus man, building science or making his bond with science after he rejects God, is rewarded by finally becoming the hopeless slave of his new master, who leads him inevitably into the fulfillment of the demoniacal pact. And this pact between reason or the human mind and the skill of science turns upon the common man, turns upon the collective, Marguerite, and produces such a phenomenon as the bombing at Hiroshima, in which hundreds of thousands perish as the result of the union of the human mind and scientific skill. Thus we have, long before the idea of a bomb ever came into existence, the recognition that the rise of skill, unsustained by integrity, unsupported by a vision of spiritual values, must ultimately lead to a pact being signed, a pact signed in blood. And as Mephisto says when he hands the pact to Faust, sign it in blood, for blood is a most peculiar essence. And this is exactly the case. And man has signed in blood the pact between mind and skill, and has turned this skill to the ravishing of his world, represented by his brutal treatment of Marguerite, her final madness and death. So here we have a little clearer concept of what Goethe was working with, and knowing the particular psychology of his time and the attitude of the German intellectual that was contemporary with Goethe, we know that this thought was prevalent in the minds of these people, and perhaps may have resulted in Goethe referring to Mephisto himself as a Junker, 
as a Prussian aristocrat, as one of a ruling class, because one of the unions of mind and skill was the creation of the great German military machine, which was already beginning uh, to be intimated, to be suggested, even at the time of Gaeta, and certainly uh, was the object of a powerful uh, exposition by Wagner in his um, metapolitical operatic productions. Now we have a little background for the problem, so we have to look for other directions for the moment. The basic story, which covers the prologue and the motivation of the drama of Faust, is almost completely borrowed from the book of Job. And the book of Job is probably one of the most mysterious books in the entire Bible. A book about which a great deal must be said, and uh, it still remains as an enigmatical poem, because it presents to us the story of the God and the devil laying a pact for the soul of a good man. Now, in the story of Job, for example, Job is not an evil person. And when the afflictions come upon him, they are not due to the fact that he has disobeyed God, because he has not. They are due to the fact that God wishes to prove a point in a controversy with the devil. The uh, Lord says that uh, a good man will remain good, even under adversity. And the line occurs almost exactly in the uh, prologue of Faust. Namely, that a good man in his adversity will cling unto the God who made him be. The devil says, no, you get the man miserable enough and he won't stay with God. He will depart into uh, any escape that he can find. He will not stay true under infirmity. So, in the story of Job, the Lord sends these infirmities which Job has to bear as best he can. And Job, for the most part, is patient, but he has his moments when uh, patience almost ceases to be a virtue. And when he has the three celebrated comforters to assist him, he is well nigh undone. But uh, Job finally does uh, prove that God was right in having faith in Job, so that in the, in the book it says, the Lord blessed the later end of Job, and he, it was more fruitful and more glorious than the beginning. This is in substance uh, the story of Faust. Uh, Faust was not subjected to all of these mysterious circumstances because he was a bad man. Uh, he was uh, the uh, person selected by the Lord and the devil to prove a point. And uh, this in itself has made the entire story very difficult of explanation on a moral level. The moral seems to lie on the same level as that of the book of Job in which the old biblical writer attempts to point out uh, that these various problems and burdens that are sent to man are not sent to destroy him, but to test him and to prove his merits and his worth and to restore him ultimately uh, to the kingdom of truth and righteousness. So, of course, in Faust, the prologue begins in a very beautiful heavenly place. And here all the cherubs and the angels are saying nice things about God and are hymning him and are uh, adoring him and are uh, indicating all of their spontaneous and unquestioning obedience to the divine edict. And we have the wonderful lines that open the great poem, the sun intones his ancient song. Mid rival chant of brother spears, his predestined path, he thunders on in endless march throughout the years. And we also find that uh, uh, these, this wonderful thing, uh, this wonderful song, unfolds its further glories. And the song tells us that uh, angels are strengthened by its might. And uh, all of these things... Though fathom them this mystery of light, no angel may. Resplendent are the orbs of light as on creation's primal day. Everyone's happy about everything. It's a, a wonderful time is being had by everyone in heaven. All but one. And that is Mephisto. 
Mephisto is standing by with a strangely cynical look on his face. Mephisto is a disillusioned man. And yet Mephisto is welcome at the heavenly court. He has not been cast down into the abyss. He is one of the brilliant angels of the Lord. But he is the one person present who dares to differ from the Lord. And also does not raise his voice in a happy song to the glad-eyed cherubim or anything of that nature. He thanks deity and applauds deity for having permitted a doubter like himself to be present. And then having sort of gotten his place in the sun and his opportunity to say something, uh, Mephisto says, of worlds and suns I little have to say. I see alone man's self-inflicted pains. How this little world god still his stamp retains as wondrous now as on the primal, primal day. Better alas for him poor white a ye conceal the heavenly night. Reason he names it, but doth use it so each day more brutish than the brutes doth throw. And this led to that little argument that led to the decision to test old Dr. Faust. Whether or not there was this good man who could not be touched uh, by evil, even though he might come under a variety of temptations. And of this good man himself, we have later a simple introduction. He is in his laboratory. He hears outside the voices of young people and he hears the bells that are symbols of a festive day. And poor old Dr. Faust is much the worse for years. The burden of time is heavy upon him. He has studied long and meditated much. He has watched his youth slip away in the quest of knowledge and of learning, but he has not found it. And he raises his lament, Woe is me, imprisoned in the gloom of this abhorred and musty room, where heaven's dear light itself doth pass but dimly through the painted glass. Old Faust is pretty well discouraged. Everything uh, that he has ever sought, everything he has ever desired, his great search for truth has been frustrated. Because Faust was, in his own right and proper person, an honest man. He wanted uh, to know. He wanted to learn. But along had come, in some mysterious, intangible way, the heavy shadow of this thing we call the Reformation. The entire world of scholarship had been swept away, not by a single act alone, but by the changing psychology of man under the pressure of a new way of life. All these great and wonderful things, this proper scroll by Nostradamus' own hand, was not an all-sufficient guide. Nothing seemed to guide anything anywhere. And so Faust, in his dilemma, suddenly looks upon a wasted life, a life which is coming to an end, a life in which all the things that he might otherwise have had have been taken from him by the weight of his own years. He has not only given his life, but he has achieved nothing. He is with all his law, the fool no wiser than before, and there seems to be no way out. And obviously, under such pressures of circumstances, he is ready and eager uh, to hazard uh, some strange and magical spell with which to restore his failing life, with which to bring back the happy years that are gone, and give him an opportunity to live the life that he forsook in quest, in vain quest of knowledge and truth. Under such a condition as this, he was right ready to be right well tempted. And uh, even this, however, was not forced upon him. He was not immediately tempted uh, by some evil sprite. He must first of all demand this temptation. He must open himself to it. He must perform the rites and rituals which bring it. But out of his determination, he decided to form his pact with evil and to pay with his immortal soul for the privilege of the restoration of his physical estate. Now, in here we have perhaps the entire uh, drama of what we call today progress. Here we have man, a reasoning creature, possessing within himself 
a tremendous faculty of discrimination and research. We have man endowed wonderfully and richly with the powers to know. And we find that man, in spite of these powers, still remains ignorant. We see it today. We also see the troubles and trace them to the same source that had afflicted Faust. He had searched in the rubble and rubbish of ancient learning. He had read the works of other men and contemplated the old charges of magic and sorcery. And he had not found wisdom. He had discovered something that every man has to discover in the course of the search for wisdom, namely, that the mind can never know. Now this was, a, this was a hard blow for Faust. Probably he never placed it in words or even in articulate thought. But he was in the dilemma nevertheless. The dilemma of having exhausted mentality without achieving wisdom. Now the loss of this uh, hope, the loss of this belief that he could learn to know, was further complicated by the prevailing skepticism of that time in which he lost spiritual orientation. He could no longer turn to God because the concept of God had been riddled by the conflict on the level of theology. He could not have the faith that his own fathers had had. He could not resign himself to the simple moral or ethical codes of the church and go on without question. He was a thinker, and because he was a thinker, he was a doubter, and because he was a doubter, he lost one of man's most precious belongings, and that is the inner strength of faith. Having, therefore, no inward faith to lead him to truth, he did that which millions have done, hundreds of millions, in the following of the Faustian complex. He bartered faith for power. He made this, to him, fortunate uh, transaction. If he could not, as the Duke of Gloucester says in Richard II, if he cannot be the hero, he will be the knave. He is going to gain his end, and because he has lost his inner guidance, because he can no longer have this inner simplicity of the child heart, as Mencius calls it, he tries to force his way by the control of material or natural power. So Mephisto appears to him, not only in his famous red suit, but also in the guise which has tempted perhaps more mortals than any other appearance in her, on earth, and that is the guise of temporal power. This is the same principle, again, as that which is said to have stood beside Jesus on the mountain overlooking the city, asking the Master to exchange the kingdom of heaven for the cities of the earth, tempting him. On which occasion Jesus said to the demon, Get thee behind me, Satan. But Faust didn't say that. He ushered him in and made good friends with him immediately. Because here was what seemed to be the way out. And this is the way that all human beings have chosen, or most have chosen, particularly in this uh, gradually rising materialism that has marked the interval between the 16th and the 20th century. Discouraged of being able to solve the mystery of himself, man has become content to attempt to solve the mystery of everything else. This has become his dream. And uh, when you ask the individual, is he happy, he will answer, well, we will have interplanetary space stations almost any day now. Keeping his mind away from himself, man has tried to forget that he is the weakest link in his own chain, that his own ignorance of himself has never yet been corrected. And because he simply affirms that he does progeny, and that therefore his only immortality lay in the fact that he had a son. All of this rounding him out made him not only less conscious of his own conduct, but made him comparatively indifferent to the future. The modern materialist, to the degree that he is a materialist, neither 
accepts nor rejects, as we understand it, any concept of life beyond the grave. To him there is neither heaven nor hell, there is only darkness. Certainly it is true that he got rid of hell, but in so doing he got rid of heaven with it, because he could not accept one polarity without the other. So the idea of retribution or penalty beyond the grave could not extend beyond the honor of his name, or that perhaps his children might suffer from his evil reputation or his um, unhelpful habits. All these things locked him more and more within the only escape that he knew, and that is the escape of power, of physical glory, of the building of empire, of the waging of war, of heroism, barbarism, and death in the name of progress. This concept, then, was exactly the career that Mephisto had in mind. For Mephisto represents this great escape mechanism. It represents the psychological alliance of man with the material world. And he signs a pact with materialism that if materialism will serve him for 20 years or 30 years or 40 years, whatever the pact may be, that he in turn will give himself to materialism. And that when the time comes, he will lie down in the open grave and join the dust of his ancestors. There is nothing more to it. Uh, the material earth will swallow him up. Great Pan will take his own. And in the end, it makes no difference anyway. The good and the bad, the rich and the poor, the great and the small, come to a common end, and there are no pockets in shrouds. So the end is the hopelessness and despair that uh, materialism offers only as the inducement for those who sign a pact with her ways and dedicate themselves to her service. So once having um, achieved its union uh, with materialism, the human mind now suddenly discovers that there are many things it can do. It has been given a demon or a spirit uh, for a servant. It has been given electricity. It has been given chemistry, magnetism. It has been given mathematics, astronomy, music, art, literature, everything. And it can use these things as it pleases without moral curb or ethical fear. Because it makes no difference whether we are the hero or the knave. Have our way as long as we can. Command what we can command. Rule what we can rule and prepare to die. This was a, a rather gallant deal in its own way. And it freed Faust entirely from all moral restraint, from all of the ancient doctrines which would have told him that the path of glory led but to the grave. It freed him to go on, but it also placed him under a penalty. For in the signing of the pact, Faust made a strange kind of pledge to Mephisto, saying to him, if ever to the passing hour I say, O oh, stay, thou art so fair, then to thee I give the power to drag me down to hell's despair. Then may my fate no longer linger, then from my service thou art free. Fall from the clock the index finger, be time all over then for me. And I think that that is exactly what happens. For the moment we stop, the moment we pause, the moment we have peace, even for an instant, the tremendous fallacy of the entire project bursts through upon us. We cannot relax. We cannot stop for one moment this frightening, fearful quest of the next instant. Because if we pause... If we consider, if we seek one substantial joy in this entire picture, the whole pageantry of our pact falls to pieces around our ears. So we must keep going. We must never think. We must never question. We must never doubt. We must hurtle our way on, never pausing long enough to reflect upon a single action, or else the madness of our pact becomes immediately obvious to us. 
And then in the course of all this, in this ravishing of nature, of this exploiting and spoiling of the world in which we have come to live, man's complete dedication to materialism is revealed in his betrayal of Marguerite, or the betrayal of his own soul. He not only betrays the soul in the sense of his own inner psychic life, but he betrays the collective soul of mankind. He betrays the natural good. He perverts the natural hope. He diminishes the natural love, which is in all things. And Faust, and uh, particularly through Goethe, gives us a clue to this, because we know that Goethe was essentially much interested in the educational theories of Europe. He realized that the Faustians, under the control of the Mephisto instinct, were gradually but inevitably closing in upon the minds of the collective body of mankind. Education was being twisted and turned away from idealism into realism. Step by step, the dreams of men were being destroyed in the name of truth, in the name of fact, in the name of scientific knowledge. Until little by little, the psychic life of the race, the principle of the redeeming power of the normal, natural, internal instinct of man was being perverted. So that man no longer had available to him the inner guidance of his own soul or of his own spiritual conviction. This soul had been betrayed and turned to madness uh, by the ambitions of this false lover, who apparently, coming as a handsome youth, was really this individual bound only by obligation to power and ambition. Now, in the story, as we develop it in the, in the, in the original poem, Faust never really repents. Faust is never actually sorry for what he did. But something happens that takes the place of that repentance. And that is the thing, perhaps, that even Mephisto intuitively knew. Because if Faust is suffering from a very grave emergency of character, Mephisto, uh, embodying as he does the entire rebellion of the mortal mind against divine mind, is in a still more difficult position because Mephisto is a god. Mephisto is a being who can stand at the very footstool of the Almighty and talk back to God himself. In Mephisto's consciousness, there are no illusions. Mephisto knows the game, he knows how it is played, and he knows its inevitable end. Mephisto suffers from the fatal realization that as the adversary, he must lose. He may have a long period of apparent victory, but Mephisto knows that this ancient foundation which has endured from the beginning, the eternal throne will ultimately vanquish all of the works of darkness. So Mephisto uh, is not deceived by his own role, although at times he prefers to ignore it. And I think in a way that this also plays a part in what we may call materialistic knowledge today. I don't think there is a materialist regardless of his addiction to limited perspective, who actually believes that he has the answer. I think he knows within himself that he is on some kind of a treadmill, that he is in some kind of a situation from which he can see no escape, but which does not lead to solution. And I think this knowledge has become especially obvious to him in the last 25 to 50 years, where of all men, the trained thinker, the scientist, uh, the skilled intellectual realizes the desperate and dangerous game that he is playing and realizes that along the path he is following may well come inevitable disaster. Perhaps this is why the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology suddenly decided to include a course on the humanities in its physics department. It suddenly began to realize that this generation this generation of young minds that had taken or signed their pact with Mephisto, with power, with skill, with knowledge without good, that these young people were getting to be too dangerous to themselves and too dangerous to their instructors, that all this knowledge could well ultimately lead to a holocaust which would destroy everything that man has ever built. 
And so Mephisto, uh, representing and embodying this headlong course of action, is not entirely happy about it himself. But he prances about and dances about and never reveals to Faust uh, the melancholy in his own nature. In the great's poem, as it is completely unfolded, Faust is divided as a story into two parts. The one part beginning, I would say, on a religious level. The beginning, the first step, or the highest part, being essentially religious. religious. It then descends into the second part, which is essentially philosophical, and finally falls into the third section, which is essentially ethical. And in the ethical part, we find the, the final descent of Faust to the compromise and destruction of his own ethical code. So that the first part of Faust, together, is a fall through three worlds, through a spiritual, intellectual, and material state, and final tragedy on the level of materialism. The second part of Faust, which is sometimes referred to as the redemption of Faust, is so fantastic in its structure and so elaborate in its presentation that it would almost defy an adequate theatrical presentation, except probably on the level of a very expensive motion picture, as it could be done today. But in the old days, it was not stageable in any kind of an adequate manner. In this, we have what might be termed the redemption of Faust. But this redemption begins upon a moral level, gradually ascends through what might be termed an ethical level, and finally achieves its consummation on a platform which we might almost term mystical or metaphysical. Uh, the essential theme of it being that Faust is not redeemed uh, by any direct repentance of his own, nor is he redeemed by any vicarious intercession. He is redeemed primarily by one thing, what he himself has learned. In other words, uh, Faust is redeemed by a series of experiences which transform him, until by transforming his own inner life, he achieves a state of consciousness in which he can no longer be held by his pact to Mephistopheles. He simply outgrows it. And in the process of outgrowing it, he escapes the pact. He cannot break it, but he can transcend it. And in the transcending of it, he arrives at a state in which the fiend is completely baffled. And he is strangely redeemed almost as we find in the Divine Comedy of Dante. If you remember when the time came for Dante to rise out of the purgatorio, or to come out of the underworld, he did so by climbing up upon the very body of the demon itself, which was the only way out. And uh, Faust, in the story of, uh, of his relation with Mephistopheles, is actually saved by Mephistopheles himself. It is a subtle thing, but it is actually there. Because it is this power, this energy of evil, constantly forcing him on, that finally causes him to break with evil. It causes him to recognize, as Mephisto himself had earlier said, that he was part of a power that works for good while ever scheming ill. And through the entire story, uh, Mephisto is leading Faust to a great and complete disillusionment. A disillusionment with everything uh, that pertained to the glories and honors and dignities of materialism. They were exhausted by the very circumstances until finally for Faust, this world and its entire pattern of glory no longer held any fascination, nor was no longer pleasant was no longer fulfillment, but became a heavy and terrible burden upon him. Therefore, he more or less voluntarily makes the break. Now, in the case of Dante, the journey through the Inferno is accompanied by Virgil, the guide, the all-sufficient guide who leads him on. But when he comes to the Paradiso, 
uh, Dante comes under the guidance of Beatrice, a beautiful and uh, wonderful symbol used by the old troubadours to represent Sophia, the great wisdom of the world. The same in another way happens also to Faust, because in his search for reality, we come upon that wonderful line that the eternal feminine leads him on. It is the soul, actually, which finally rescues him. But it is a soul that has been changed from an innocent girl to a very wise and almost prophetess-like woman, a symbol of all knowledge, skill, and attainment. A very different type of psychic integration than that which is suggested in the first part of the story. And so Faust completes his wonderful cycle and finally is redeemed, not by a redeeming power, but by what we might term the negative redemption of disillusionment. Faust suddenly discovers the complete and total emptiness of the thing through which he has passed and ex what he has experienced. And in this phase, I'm always reminded very strongly of the parallel that we find in the writings of Jacob Demi, the German mystic of Gerlitz. This shoemaker gives us a very interesting parallel of the relations between God and demon. Because we are carried in the allegory or in the fable out into space. And in space we find one brooding figure standing upon a great cloud with folded wings of sable hue, a great brooding figure leaning upon a sword and standing looking out into the infinite. And this brooding figure is Satan. And this brooding figure is almost divine in its own right. For within it is not only the creative power of God, but the infinite courage and strength of the divine will. And this being has come out of the mysteries of outer space to stand before the throne of the Almighty and to offer itself as a vassal of God. And it stands there and it speaks and it sends its voice out into the great mysterious darkness that lies about it, out towards one softly roseate cloud that seems to be hovering over the great vistas of space like some dim northern light. And the powerful angel calls out and asks God to reveal himself. And out of the cloud and out of the mystery and out of the darkness comes the voice of a baby, a very tiny child. And this voice of the child, so faint, so small, so gentle, as to hardly be audible, says, yes, did you wish me to speak to me? And in that moment, Satan is so completely shocked and so completely baffled that he leans upon his sword and thinks, is this voice, this child voice, this voice alone in space, is this God? And if this is God, what can we expect of divinity? Here are all the clouds, the stars, and the cosmos. Are they to be managed and directed by a small child? Where is the glorious court of heaven? Where are the choirs of the angels and the archangels and the seraphs and the cherubim? Where are the principalities and the powers and the dominions? Nothing there but the voice of a child speaking gently in the voice of love. And Satan says to himself, I guess I'd better do something about this. This is no way to run a universe. And if this is the measure of things, I think I'd better take over. So in this moment, Satan rebels against the Lord. And in this moment, when in his mind comes the thought, I will take over, I will be the king of kings and the ruler of the world. In that instant, the heavens are shattered from edge to edge. The sky rolls back. The clouds break open. And out of this mist and darkness and out of these rosy shadows, 
there bursts a light that strikes upon Satan with such a tremendous power that he is cast down upon his knees. And there suddenly before him, in all of its effulgent glory, is the God of might and the God of battles. The soft voice has disappeared, and now stands all the glory of the armies of the Lord under the cycle pompous of the archangel Michael. And here are the hosts of heaven in their golden armor, and an ineffable glory and an ineffable strength beyond all human understanding. And Satan cannot understand. He does not know what has happened. And the voice explains to him that when he came in gentleness and humility of speech, of, uh, of a speech and appeal, he was brought into the presence of the great meekness, which is God. For God is always the gentle voice to those who come in obedience. But God is always the voice that is almost impossible to hear, the childish little voice of those who obey. But the moment there comes into the mind of man arrogance, worldliness, and power, the God of meekness disappears, and there is beheld the vassals of wrath. In that instant the sky opens, and the power of the heavens is revealed or are, is revealed in all its glory. Not because heaven has changed, but because rebellion has changed the sight of the one who beheld it. The glory was always there, but the meek in heart see only the meekness, but the proud, the proud behold only the wrath. And this was the battle between the divine mind and the mortal mind, between the, the will of heaven and the will of man. And in this great battle, man, by disobedience, released the wrath and came under the power of the retribution of natural law. Man knows of no laws until he breaks them. Man knows of no wrath until he disobeys. Man is not aware that there is in the universe anything but beauty until he breaks the law. And this was Bailey's expression or interpretation of the rebellion and the fall of the archangel Lucifer and his hosts and the great war in heaven. And this in substance is also the burden of the concept in Faust because the two stories have almost identical meaning. Faust in his original sincerity was searching for the world of God. When he could not find it he rebelled. And in his mental rebellion, his discouragement, his resignation to negative inevitables, he opened himself to the retribution of mortal mind. And mortal mind, or selfish mind, represented by Mephisto, becomes his servant. But mortal mind leads man only to self-destruction, leads him only to ways of darkness and evil, and finally results in his complete undoing. In the end of the first part of the play, however, this false thinking, having brought Faust to the lowest pitch of tragedy, we find the revulsion taking place within himself, the revulsion which finally, through a kaleidoscopic series of circumstances, brings him back again to the recognition that the good man, even in his infirmity, will cling unto the Lord who made him be and that he will find in the end the only answer to the whole great conflict, and that answer is simple faith, the simple acceptance of truth itself as a principle, whether he can possess it, know it, or understand it or not, the simple return to obedience, and the moment he obeys, the wrath vanishes and the power of the tempter is destroyed. So by returning to the original destiny and the nature which was his proper place in the world, the entire mystery or story is brought to its magnificent and dramatic conclusion. Now we know that Faust was dramatized in a great many ways at early periods in medieval history. We know that it was almost at one time a miracle play. It was part of the concept of the moral growth of humanity. And there is no question that the larger implications lie on the psychological level. 
And on this level, we have certain structure also to analyze. We have, for instance, to realize that man, as man, as ego, as selfhood, the hero of the world, so to speak, must be played by Faust. We know also that man possesses a power which is called will. And we know that this power of will, as Buddha has well pointed out to us, is in a wonderful and strange way the supreme adversary with which man has to contend in his search for reality. We know that it is man's will to be, will to do, will to have, and will to know that these willings are in a subtle and mysterious manner absolutely contrary to the law of truth. We know that the individual creates for himself misery, darkness, and death by the exercise of his own will over the principle of universal reality. Man demanding to do as he wills creates the situation that ultimately brings him to the precarious edge of self-destruction. Buddha points this out very definitely. Misery is due to the exercise of the will. The individual who wills creates adversary because the very motion of will produces its inevitable negative result. And man can never achieve truth by will. Man achieves truth not by conquest, not by reaching out with the tremendous courage of his own imagination, nor with the power of his own purposes. Man achieves error by action, by will, by the exertion of faculties and powers. Man attains truth by complete relaxation, by complete acceptance, by the complete renunciation of self-will in the presence of divine will. Therefore, as Lao Tzu so well points out, the way of reality or the path to Tao is the effortless effort, the effort in which there is no self-purpose, but man gradually coming into adjustment with universal purpose, described by Lao Tzu as motion the universal Tao, or the motion of the infinite in all things. Thus man, by attaining conscious conformity with the rhythm of being, becomes identical with being. This he does by fulfilling the simple biblical admonition, Be still and know that I am God. Through the stillness, through what Maya the Rosicrucian calls the silentum post clamoris, or the silence after the sound and the striving, the sound and the fury, man, by renunciation of self-will, redeems himself from the tyranny of this strange, fantastic energy, which he has, apparently, forever at his disposal. In doing according to his own will, what does man do? From the exercise of self-will comes first the experience of self-existence. Man wills his own ego into existence. He wills himself to say, I am, which is the primary impulse of his will. Having thus affirmed his own existence and having centered himself in the midst of his own hypothetical circle, man then says, because I am, I can do, I can be, I can have, I can know. So having created all of these concepts, he proceeds to follow them as Wallace followed the heart of Bruce in battle. He tosses the heart ahead of him and goes in and dies to follow it. Having created selfness, the individual can possess, he can lose, he can gain. He can pass through innumerable experiences, all of them on the plane of illusion. He can capture, he can lose, because he has accepted or assumed the reality of his own uh, will nature, his own mortal mind controlling all things. The end of this is Schopenhauer's Superman, 
the man with the will to power, the will to power of Nietzsche, this tremendous being who is to conquer all things by the indefatigable exertion of the will to be, the will to do, and the will to have. All these willings together can only result also in the will to overcome the will of another willing creature. So we have the conflict of will, and we have a very disorderly universe in which everyone, with his own will, is attempting to overwhelm the will of everyone else. Each individual, therefore, feels all obstruction or obstacle as an immovable object opposing the expression of his own inevitable force. This is the world of force, the world of intrigue, the world of plot and counterplot. And this will is again identified with the Mephisto concept. Now what happens when we start all this willing? All willing leads to what might be termed the grand frustration. Because no matter what we will, we never quite make it. We are never able to overcome boundaries over which the will has no dominion. We follow this will of the wisp toward the success we seek, only to tumble into a grave instead. We have the achievement which we have longed for and learn that we have paid for it with health and happiness and friendship so that when we have it, it is meaningless. So this will ends constantly in psychosis. The more tremendously we exercise selfhood, the sicker we get, day by day, year by year, until we become what are known as psychotics. And these psychotics are individuals who by their own conduct have diseased their own souls. For these psychoses develop frustrations, fixations, neuroses, phobias, introversions, manias, and innumerable other ailments, so that one by one all these excesses become a corrupting influence that moves in upon the psychic life of the individual, perverts it and destroys it, and finally brings man into a state of internal psychic sickness. And this internal psychic sickness is the betrayal of his own soul, in this case, Marguerite, whose personal life and happiness he has destroyed, and who therefore, appropriately, as in the case of the psychotic, she ends in madness and self-destruction. The soul, therefore, is the victim. The victim of every excess is registered in the invisible bodies of man to become the basis of psychic sickness. The thought forms, the emotional forms, these monsters of negation described by Paracelsus as the incubus and the succubus, all these things are the creations of selfishness, degeneracy in the psychic atmosphere of man. And they arise one and all, as Buddha tells us, from the simple seed of selfishness, self-will, the determination of the individual to succeed at the expense of truth. <coughs> so in his headlong journey to the gratification of his every desire, Faust betrays his own soul, reduces and destroys this one who trusts upon him, misrepresents himself to her, and finally brings her in madness and sorrow to an untimely end. Thus the entire psychic drama within man himself is adequately and properly played out. Faust, of course, at this time in the opera is supposed to be dragged down to the inferno with his infernal master. But in the larger version of the story he wanders on comparatively untouched by the misery that he has caused. He goes out then trying to forget the damage he has done. Just as the materialist and the average individual, having caused great sorrow by his own misdeeds, goes on in his endless course of forgetfulness. And in small ways and little manners and things that we do every day, many of our so-called escape mechanisms are simply the effort to forget the injustice we have done to our own psychic integrity. 
And when we follow almost any escapism that is not essentially good, it is because we can no longer endure the mysterious psychic unbalance which we have created within ourselves. And so we start on this strange, wandering mystery of travel to heaven and hell, to all kinds of strange spheres and romantic places, who are carried on the wings of the wind by our ever-present Mephistopheles, who is ever there to oblige, and who is to change the world into a fantasy for us, a fantasy of imagination and delusion, anything to help us to forget. But ultimately we cannot forget, because we have broken rules, broken patterns, and have formed false alliances with the principles and energies ruling life. So in the end, we come finally to the termination of our course, uh, sadder but wiser. And out of all of this tremendous extravaganza, we come finally to the realization that by a strange, gentle, sensitive acceptance of the divine will, we release ourselves from all these strange and difficult experiences. And at the same time, confound the fiend who thinks he has come to possess us. Now, very much the same thing is recorded in the lives of a great many individuals of importance, particularly in religion. We remember, for instance, the career of St. Augustine, who never ceased to reproach himself for the iniquities and injustices which he had committed in his earlier life and devoted much of his years to repentance. We also find the same story in the case of St. Francis de Assis, who, starting out as a very physical and a worldly person finally realized that this path could not lead to happiness or peace. The Faustian story then, of course, takes on the attitudes and attributes of the man forgetting himself or trying to, and finding that in so doing, by this negative absorption of his own life into materialism, he has destroyed the very best of his own character and his own nature and has achieved nothing. Mephisto always present as temptation, representing excuse, evasion, any substantiation or substitution that is necessary to make the illusion more beautiful, more apparent, but no more substantial, uh, is the whole body, the entire concept of evasion and avoidance, the endless compromising which we do in the effort to make things easier. All of these elements have been rather carefully examined on a psychological level to determine the natures and attributes of all these parts and their places in our philosophical life. If we go back to the consideration of ourselves as the symbols of Faust, if we place ourselves psychologically as the principal actor in this uh, cosmic drama of moral and ethic, then we must realize that each of us, during the course of life, passes much through the cycle that is described in this story. Each individual passes through the periods of disillusionment, in which the values and ideas which he thought were real crumble around him. Every time a dream fades, every time a hope apparently is destroyed, man falls into negative patterns and negative ways. And in each case he must make his decisions, whether he will uh, follow along the lines of success and compromise, or whether he will stay with his principles. And of course, the larger path of compromise, represented by the vast motion of the world around him, is the ever-alluring prospect of the pact with Mephisto. The world seems to offer so much to the individual who will compromise his own integrity. He can be almost sure of becoming richer. He can be almost certain that he will become more famous. He will be advanced to the degree that his morals do not interfere with his progress. Consequently, uh, not so very long ago, here in the uh, city of Los Angeles, uh, the school board uh, decided to make a noble experiment. They decided to introduce into the classwork each day a new program to begin each morning with a very brief reading of a few lines or a sentence or two from some great spiritual or moral leader, preferably not one of the four or five associated with the outstanding religions because of creedal problems. But it was decided that it would be nice to open the day with a great thought from Socrates, or a great line from Confucius, 
or a wonderful uh, verse of Plato to start the young people off right. What happened? All the parents stormed the uh, teacher's uh, room down at the city hall where the Board of Education met and asked to have this discontinued. A mass meeting was held of irate parents. One of these parents got up and said, we do not want our children to be taught ethics because if they become ethical, they will be economic failures. We want you to teach them to be business people. We want you to educate them in business, but we do not want you to interfere with their ethics because the more ethical they become, the poorer they will be. And we want rich and successful children. So that would be very largely, just exactly, all Mephisto moving in on the situation. Leave out the ethics, leave out the morality, give us the facts. Well, these facts, as represented by scientific materialism, are a strange and wonderful and powerful and terrible thing. They represent strength, power, almost inconceivable. When we think of Mephisto carrying Faust around the world in the glance of an eye, we are thinking, perhaps, of aeroplanes. When he can carry messages and he can see things in other parts of the world, perhaps television, radio, the telephone, long before these things were invented, were already parts of this great magical world that Mephisto could open to Faust. But in order to live in it, Faust must sign this pact and exchange his soul for the conveniences and commodities of his time. Every time we go in debt, we do the same thing. Every time we spend beyond our means, we sell something of our soul for a bowl of pottage. We do it because we place ourselves in a position where we are indebted to our world, where we have formed a pact, where we have made a contract, which we must keep, even if it is at the expense and compromise of our principles. The heavier we become in debt, the more we must compromise. The greater our demand for luxuries, the more we must compromise. Thus, every day in every way, the individual becomes more and more enmeshed in this strange sphere of illusion and fantasy. He signs the pact with his own blood and pays for it with his own life. That these principles should exist in this way, that this great moral drama should have been preserved so carefully, and at the same time not more deeply have influenced the life of mankind, shows how strangely the fascination of materialism has closed in upon man a fascination which makes him willing to ignore the magnificent opportunity to be a person, to be a great human being in substance and spirit, and has made him willing to exchange possessions for the self-possession which he has lost. So in the story of Faust we have the great compromise, the compromise that must always end in tragedy. And as we look out at the United Nations, as we look out at Suez and Hungary, as we look out at China, as we look around the world today and see the great compromise, anything to avoid the facing of facts, anything to prevent a break in this strange, twisted system which has gradually come to control us and dominate us, we begin to see that perhaps in a subtle, mysterious, symbolical way, a very large part of mankind has signed the pact in blood and must pay in blood. And that the story of Faust is actually the tragedy of any individual who, turning from solution within himself upon a level of ethics, seeks through compromise to attain comfort and convenience. All that he gains is what modern man has gained, debt, inconvenience, suffering, and death. So the uh, devil has his due, regardless of anything else. But through this, and this alone, Mephisto attains the purposes intended in the divine mind. For it is only apparently through the tragedies of abuse and misuse that man finally grows to the point of his own redemption. And having a redeemed himself through a clearer understanding of his own inner life, he is able to break or transcend the pact, free his soul, and escape from the clutches of mortal mind, selfishness, sin, and death, the last enemies to be overcome. This, in my estimation, carries at least a part of the moral-ethical implication of Faust, and gives us 
it seems to me, the foundation upon which the drama was built, not only by Gated, but also by Marlowe, and most of all, the great prologue in the book of Job. All of these things fit together and tell us that the story is man's compromise with truth. His corruption, his fall, his betrayal of his fellow man, represented by Marguerite, finally experience, disillusionment, an ultimate regeneration and redemption through the acceptance of self-responsibility and the gradual resigning of his mortal mind and mortal will uh, to obedience to the divine law. As Lord Bacon said, the end of knowledge is that man shall obey. And it is in this line of ultimate obedience to truth that the triumphant chord of the ultimate strokes of this great drama will be found sounded clearly and magnificently. The story that begins in heaven ends in heaven, but there are long dark days on earth in between. Well, I think that is our...